Thank you, Sawyer. Um, so I can do the introduction. So I'm Melissa Gans. Um, I will be moderating today's session. I'm part of the Early Career Immunology Society um, for CIS. Um, and I would like to introduce um, Jessica Kun, who is our pediatrics resident um, at University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital, where I also am, and she is a future allergist and immunologist who will be applying soon for fellowship. Um, and Rafaela Golbach-Monsky, who is our senior mentor today for our case. We are very thankful that she is here. Um, she is a senior investigator and chief of the translational auto-inflammatory diseases section at NIAD and an expert in auto-inflammatory disorders, which we will be discussing today. If you'd like to hear more about auto-inflammatory disorders, make sure to attend the education day. Um, as a part of the CIS this year, which is included in your registration, and she'll be giving a fantastic lecture then. Um, a reminder that the CIS conference is May 1st through May 4th in Minneapolis, and the early bird registration ends on February 17th. Um, we have just one case today. We'll take just about 30 minutes, plus or minus, um, and I will be moderating the chat. And with that, Jessica, you can get started. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Gans. So just give me one moment to share the screen. Okay. How is that? Awesome. Okay. So we can go ahead and get started. And then just um, to reiterate what Dr. Gans was saying, we would love to have everyone's participation today. So feel free to stop us at any point. Um, but today we'll be presenting a case about a male child with intermittent fevers. So to start, here's our patient presentation. So we report the case of an eight-year-old previously healthy boy who came into our office with an 18-month history of intermittent recurrent biweekly fevers. The longest lasting was three days in duration. Um, they would occur without any discernible pattern, and they were low-grade temperatures, usually 105 101.5 to 103 Fahrenheit was what was documented. And then outside of that, they occurred in the absence of associated infectious symptoms. So the patient did say that he um, occasionally would have frontal headaches, and the patient would treat these symptoms with ibuprofen and acetaminophen, which would temporarily relieve his symptoms. Otherwise, our patient was very well between episodes. His vitals, growth, and development were otherwise normal. So notably, our patient also did have a two-week episode of a non-paritic erythematous macular papular rash um, with some areas of peeling that were involving his bilateral PIPs, palms, and the flexor surfaces of his bilateral elbows and knees. This was actually last week. We saw the patient in clinic on Thursday. So it was a one-time rash just to keep in mind. But outside of that, his, pres his presentation had no associated symptoms no recurrent or chronic infectious symptoms or rashes, no URI symptoms, ulcers, GI symptoms, pulmonary manifestation, no family history of similar presentation or really any other clinical manifestation at all. So if this patient was in your office, I'll go back so you can see a little bit and remind yourself as to the presentation, but what would you wanna order? And at this point, either feel free to write in the text or write in the chat and Dr. Gans will moderate or feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and also take take a look at that rash in particular. Is there anything that anyone thinks of with that rash? Mm -hmm. um, it was dry. It was also on the palms and the palms were peeling a little bit erythematous, a little bit itchy, but didn't bother him too so, so much. It was going on for a couple of weeks. Um, but what laboratory workup would like, feel free to put in the chat. Okay, perfect, thank you. So CBC with diff, CRP, ESR, inflammatory markers, someone thinks it's dermatomyositis, military awesome. markers, muscle enzymes, serum amyloid A. Um, great, okay, Jessica, go ahead. Awesome, thanks for your participation. So we have the initial laboratory studies here. So we have it in two panels, so there's more coming. Um, but given he had periodic fevers and the absence of infectious etiology, we we started off with like a workup for viral etiology as well as malignancies and autoinflammatory states. So as you can see here, um, his original lab results, um, the original studies he had, his basic labs, his CBC with BIF, CMP, and UA, those were all normal. His ESR and ferritin as well as CRP up here were normal as well. 
And then we, some of his rheumatologic workup is on this side and some of it's on the next side. But notably on this side, we have normal TPO, CCP, chromatin antibody, anti-SM antibody, RNP, Sjogren's, CSL70, JO1 antibody, um, Centromere B. And then also notably, um, we have normal complements for this child. And then his lymphocyte subsets as down here were all normal apart from he did have elevated NK cells. And then his immunoglobulins were also within normal as um, shown here. And then our patient did have a normal, site, a normal lymphocyte proliferation to PHA and pokeweird, but no notably it was decreased to Cane, Canada, tuberculin, and tetanus, as you can see up here. So um, then on our next... Sorry, so stop you for a minute. So Raphael, maybe if you, you could chime in, what do you think um, as the rheumatologist, um, what do you think of the autoantibodies there? Is there anything in your workup for patients with periodic fevers that you, is there more autoantibodies that you want? What do you think of that profile? You just have to unmute yourself. End of note, we have a we have um these yeah. as well in the next slide that it, we didn't yet review. I think the next slide is more helpful because when you think about an autoinflammatory disease, you don't expect disease-specific autoantibodies associated with common rheumatic diseases such as a juvenile dermatomyositis. You would actually expect um, um, uh, myosin-specific antibodies, which are negative. You tested those. Um, but what is very common in interferonopathies is to have low titer ANA antibodies. And usually you can have organ-specific autoimmunity, but in most instances, the antibodies to double-stranded DNA and um, chromatin are negative. So it's usually um, an antibody to single um, uh, nucleotides or in the blood that are not complexed. And, um, and sometimes you see anti, uh, anti um, cardiolipin antibodies to be weakly positive. And if the inflammatory response is really strong, you sometimes see anti-neutrophil antibodies, uh, anti-myeloproxidase uh, or um, proteinase, three antibodies, usually low titer, never as high as you would actually expect with autoimmune diseases. So these are things I would look for. And often in interferonopathies, you see actually a hypergamma globulinemia. And then maybe could you comment on the cytokine panel there, the interleukins? It was just sent commercial. So the, the cytokine panel, um, this is actually a Mayo cytokine panel that uh, is available since COVID and it's really helpful. Um, the type one, uh, the, the I1 levels um, are usually not quite quite specific. It's actually, it should be picochrome there. Um, the, the assays usually are not that sensitive. But what is unusual here is that um, IL-4, IL-5, and um, IL-13 are elevated, suggesting that there might be an allergic predisposition. This is not something we typically see associated with any particular autoinflammatory diseases, but allergic predispositions are not uncommon. And we would see it in children often with a family history of uh, an unrelated um, allergic disease. IL-10 is often elevated. It's an anti-inflammatory cytokine, so it's nonspecific. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the rest of the, the cytokines are pretty much within normal limits. Uh, the, what is elevated is IL-2 receptor. So that actually shows that there are um, immune cells that are activated. Um, typically one thing is of T cell activation, but uh, macrophages when activated also shed IL-2 receptor. So this basically is uh, an, another sign, uh, a sign of immune activation, uh, which is a little bit unusual because the set rate and the CRP in this patient are not elevated. So it does actually, um, it, it, it is actually quite sensitive for cytokine, uh, for, for, um, as a marker, particularly when IL-6 is not elevated. So it does tell you about immune activation. And the only other thing is, Jessica said, so all these labs, the inflammatory markers and the cytokine panel were done when the patient was not febrile, um, just because of convenience. What would you expect, I guess? I mean, what do you think of that? The fact yeah. that, you know, doing labs when they're febrile versus afebrile. So, I mean, again, having an ANA in somebody who does not, who is not post-viral, particularly um, if 
I mean, during viral infection, low titer ANAs are common, and then they usually normalize. But if this is a persistent pattern, one in 80 in somebody who basically has no recent infection, I would think of an auto, of, of an interferonopathy um, because you can actually see an elevated interferon signature with normal Z rate and CRP, which is not actually uncommon for Icardigodia syndrome. Many of the patients have normal Z rates and CRPs, and the other interferonopathies we typically uh, if they have more severe disease, we would actually expect to see at least the set rate to be mildly elevated, but the child is still young and doesn't really have a long-standing history. What is interesting, and I didn't actually mention that before, is that the rheumatoid factor is positive. Um, again, the rheumatoid factor is mostly positive in children who have um, a, a susceptible MHC. So we don't see this typically in interferonopathies unless the patient has one of the shared epitope um, alleles that are not uncommon, like DR0401, DR0101, DR0404. And uh, there are about 10 shared epitope um, alleles that are associated with rheumatoid arthritis. And I would almost bet, um, particularly that, uh, did you do anti-CCP antibody? If the anti-CCP um, antibody, which I don't know if you did mention that, you may not have done it. Um, no. I see CCP I there is have. negative. Yeah, this, the anti-CCP is negative. So it would still be interesting. If the anti-CCP was positive, I I would I would basically bet that um, you have a really, really high chance to actually detect shared epitope. With just a rheumatoid factor positive, it could be post-viral, but I would check the shared epitope. That would put the patient at a higher risk for developing rheumatoid arthritis later if he, in fact, had shared epitope. So this is something... To assess. Um, and then one last question, and keep in mind, we don't want to give away the diagnosis yet. Um, but Stanley <laughs> needs put in a message to host and panelists and remind everyone. Um, so you have to change the two to everyone when you send a message so that everyone can see it. Um, but it says, what do you think of the low titer cellular bridge pattern? What does that mean? I think for the ANA. Yeah, I think he was referring to this one here. Oh, the ANA. I, 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 as I mentioned, if the ANA is low titer positive, uh, the first thing that would come to my mind in somebody who has no other features would be, does this patient have chronic or elevated interferon upregulation? You do actually see this post-viral. Uh, where patients not untypically develop um, an ANA antibody, but if you repeat it and it still is positive in the context of some other form of inflammation, I would think of an abnormal interferon signature and I would basically um, um, follow that um, if all the other autoantibodies are negative. And does the pattern mean anything specific to you, the fact that it's mitotic intercellular bridge? Oh, that is the intracellular bridge. Um, not... <sighs> Not really. I think it is a, it's a more um, non-specific pattern. Thank you, Jessica. You can go on. Amazing. Thank you. So next, we were hoping to just get everyone's thoughts on what might be going on. Um, and then when in doing when doing this, also just keep in mind the patient's rash. So also keep that on the differential. We have Patrick O'Connell who thinks FMF. Okay. Anyone else? Max Norris wants to know if CMV and EBV checked. We we did not. Um, wondering, Max, if you could chime in why you're asked about CMV and EBV. Just in terms of recurrent fevers, rolling out infectious ideologies, or is there something else in particular? Anyone else like to chime in? More audience participation? And feel free to unmute as well. I don't think they can unmute, Jessica. Uh, I see. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Stanley also said, so inflammatory, so viral. Uh, B19V with poor control. Carl wants to go back to the rash again. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the rash was around just for a couple of weeks. Um, 
dry on the sensor surfaces and then also on the palms the palms were peeling right caps melinda says okay great um jessica maybe show your differential okay great because it came up anyway so perfect um so here we have listed what we were thinking of um we did a pretty pretty broad on the left we had our differential like secondary to any kind of immune dysregulation so like you guys mentioned um we listed some of the inflammasomopathies, including HIDS. I think someone said FMF, TRAPS, you guys said as well, CAPS, you said um, PFA, PA. And then we also listed SAVI, AGS, and DNAs2 deficiency. And then on the right, kind of a little more broad. So like malignancy, pre-malignancy, rheumatologic diseases. Um, we also thought of like an endocrine pathology. We, someone I think said like the acute or chronic infections and then hereditary fevers, um, cyclic neutropenia, drug fevers. So you guys touched on some of the some of the main ones, which is awesome. Perfect. So what would be our next steps if we had um, this patient as well as the laboratory studies we have so far? Anything else that you would want to order? Um, in the meantime, I'm going to let you know a few other things from the chat. So, oh, sure. Um, Adrian said trap, so then PFAPA, chill, chill lane, surf, so syndrome of undifferentiated recurrent fever disorder. Um, Max wants to know if the rash was itchy. It was slightly itchy, not intensely pruritic, um, but it did slightly bother him. Um, people want genetic testing, so let's, let's go to that. Amazing. Great. So that was our next step. So we got the um, commercial genetic testing with Invitae. So it was the 574 genes of inborn areas of immunity. Um, so it actually came back with two variants of uncertain significance as we have listed up here. So the first one was in the gene IRF2BP2. So it had a description of associations to CVID, though when we were reviewing it, we thought this was likely like less likely, lower on our differ differential given our patient's presentation with normal immunoglobulins and also absence of any type of recurrent infection. But then upon further review, we looked at the second VUS they listed, um, and it was in the gene TMEM173, which has a pretty well-established known association to autosomal dominant infantile onset sting associated vasculopathy, also known as SAVI, um, though the particular variant listed the G207E um, was a variant that has no real known clinical significance. So we looked at the, um, the described variant was a G to E substitution like we talked about at the code on 207. Um, so though it was originally listed as the VUS, we looked at the, um, the study that they included here. So it's not uh, present in population databases it has been verified to be pathogenic through experimental studies. And then it's been seen in another family that we'll talk about a little later that's included in this, um, this article here, or this study, sorry, that um, has a clinical phenotype that, of SAVI. So on the right here, we have a figure that shows the G to E substitution at the code on 207. And then, um, yeah. Anything else you'd like to add for this slide, Dr. Gans? Okay, excellent. So moving forward for our audience, just a little background on SAVI. Um, so the TMEM173 gene, which is the one of the gene of interest in our genetic studies, it encodes the protein sting, which is a very crucial component of our uh, host immunity. So SAVI, the disease of interest, is a rare autoinflammatory disease that's caused by gain of function mutations in the sting one, um, which leads to elevated IFN beta production and activates the jack stat pathway. So the typical presentation for, I mean, typical presentation for a patient with SAVI, um, usually they'll present early in infancy. Um, a lot of times they'll have tachypnea and or other rashes. Um, they'll have recurrent low-grade fevers, marked vascular inflammation, and then very commonly, they'll have pulmonary manifestations as well, most commonly ILD. Um, so in terms of diagnosing uh, patients with SAVI, well, you'll start with, like we did, you'll start with the laboratory investigations, which a lot of 
I mean, we we briefly touched on earlier, but a lot of times it'll show the elevated inflammatory markers, um, the counts of lymphocyte subsets. Sometimes they can be normal or mildly decreased. And then a lot of times the patients will actually so, show hypergammaglobulinemia um, with high IgG and IgA. And then a lot of times the presence the patients will also have the presence of autoantibodies um, like ANCA and ANA. And then in terms of definitive diagnosis for these patients, we'll look to genetic testing as well as IFN signature um, for diagnosis. Great. I'd like to stop you for a second just to sure. go through a few things in the chat. So Melinda sure. shared um, the European fever score criteria. Other people like to check that out. Um, I'm curious if people find it useful. If so let, let us know in the chat. Um, I'm just wondering if the parents were tested for the de novo variant or not. Um, with parents, we plan on testing the parents. They haven't undergone the complete testing yet. The parents are asymptomatic. And I think there's one sibling who's also asymptomatic. So we assume it's de novo, but obviously we would need to confirm. Um, Scott, Canna brings up the fact that the gene name was changed to Sting1 a bit ago. Um, so some Invitae, maybe only a few months ago. Um, so Invitae hasn't changed it yet. And then Amit's asking about type one interferon score, which hasn't been done yet either. Um, and then Rafaela, I, I, I'm curious if you could, ha have you seen other Savi patients where they're not the classic Savi and they have yeah. symptoms you know, similar to this patient? Yeah, I think this is a very good question. One is um, the periodic fevers by themselves are somewhat unusual. The rash is not a savvy rash. And I think if you are, it, it actually looks like a post-viral rash. And um, it, it does not look like a vasculitic rash. Um, in fact, um, because it was so atypical, I actually showed the picture to a colleague of mine, a dermatologist. And um, I think he's correct because um, this actually disappeared. And uh, he think, he thought this was Giannoni uh, Crosti syndrome, which basically is an infantile papular acrodermatitis that is self-limited. And I think that fits your description. I wanted to actually ask you if this was recurrent at one time, but I think this was a viral rash and unrelated. Um, I think what is somewhat um, intriguing is the ANA titer that is elevated. So when we described the disease many years ago, it, typically the patients that get referred are those that are difficult to treat in the community and the severity phenotype can be worse. With the mutation or with the gene now being tested in large panels, we actually start seeing patients who have the disease, have the mutation, a disease causing mutation, but have milder disease. And we've even seen um, one of the most common mutations, which is V155M, that was initially associated or is actually present in some patients with severe lung disease in parents or in a father um, and a child who were asymptomatic. And that mutation is actually reported in six patients in the genomic database, which is in contrast to the mutation um, that Jessica just reported, this is not present in currently available databases. So um, the, 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 the point is once the mutations actually get tested for, we start seeing milder cases. Um, so I think it is important to recognize and we can discuss the risk later, but um, it is important to, to actually test and, um, and, and recognize that the presentations of these diseases can be atypical or can develop later. Excellent. Yes, we can go. Okay, I didn't know if there's anything else in the chat. Excellent. Okay, so we wanted to review with you all the literature that was um, documented in the child's genetic testing. Um, so this one, the supporting literature that uh, showed that our variant is indeed pathogenic, um, the PMID is listed there. And it basically, it's a published, uh, it's a study that was published in 2019, and it details a Finnish family um, that had the same mutation as seen as our patient. And then they had a phenotype that was consistent with SAVI um, with select lupus features. So in this study, there's actually, um, there were 10 family members, only six of the 10 were able to participate in the study. Um, so all six of them had symptoms before the age of 10, as you can see up here. 
And then um, three of the six actually had symptom onset at birth. So we'll go to the next slide. So here is their, the table that they had this in their study, and it basically just goes through the presenting symptoms. Um, so of the family described, all of the members had, uh, or many, all of the members had photosensitivity. Others listed here that they also had were alopecia, autoimmune thyroiditis, had elevated TPO, levito reticularis, skin vasculitis, um, recurrent severe infections. Um, but very notably for this for this family, they actually none of them had recurrent fevers, and they also had a very mild um, phenotype. They didn't have any lung manifestations, no ulcerative skin lesions, um, and then like we talked about, no fevers or elevated inflammatory and autoinflammatory markers. Um, And then also really interestingly with this study, um, they validated the G207E variant as seen as our patient as a gain-of-function variant by luciferase-based um, assay. Um, so interestingly though, for this case, they did validate it by combining the G207E variant that we saw in our patient with um, either one or two other high-risk alleles, but both of them were shown to be a gain-of-function mutation regardless. So to tie it together, for our patient, we had the clinical presentation, the circulating autoantibodies, and now the genetic testing. Um, we thought that this favored the diagnosis of SAVI. So for treatment for our patient, um, we actually haven't yet done anything. We've just been observing him, um, given that we, yet, we have yet to complete his full workup, which we'll go through a little bit on the next slide, but we have pending. But otherwise, Currently, um, in the literature, the treatment op options for SAVI are quite limited. So there's some data suggesting that children will have partial response to the use of steroids in treatment. However, um, for the review of the literature, for example, the top, the top right um, paper does suggest that the, their use is pretty inconsistent, um, like the results are pretty inconsistent and their use is limited in this disease. What's actually shown better promise is the use of a JAK uh, JAK inhibitors in these patients. Um, and the thought currently is that they'll offer a better response or a more substantial response for patients with SAVI. Um, anything else you would like to add for this slide, Dr. Gens? Yeah, Raphael, I'm curious what you think. Should we treat this patient with a JAK inhibitor? And what's your experience treating other patients with JAK inhibitors? Oh, that'd be great. Oh. So um, I think first, this patient had a post-viral syndrome, and I think it would be good to repeat some of the markers that are indicative of, of interferon signaling, such as the ANA, and um, also the cytokine pattern to actually look at the activation markers of, uh, of blood cells to see if that returns by, by itself. Um, one of the problems with the SAVI mutation is that um, it can lead to autoactivation, but it can also lead to persistent interferon response. But the fact is that downregulated inflammatory response are controlled by a whole set of different genes. So finding out where this patient is, whether he can normalize um, his uh, inflammatory response, um, I think would be helpful when deciding whether or not to treat. Um, I think it is useful to repeat or to actually do an interferon signature and see if that persists and then repeat it to make sure that this is not on its way down because he might have, he likely has developed an interferon signature in the context of a viral infection. But then if he has an immune system that allows him to shut down, the interferon signature turns normal often within a few days. Um, and certainly with the resolution of the viral infection, but in SAVI, it would stay on. So if the interferon signature were to be elevated, then I think treatment could be considered. If not, I think you can watch. However, you should check um, a chest CT because um, asymptomatic lung disease is not uncommon. And um, the development of respiratory symptoms usually only occurs in the context of already quite significant lung damage. So we would screen, uh, we, we suggest to screen every child that has the mutation with um, chest CT. 
and also for aspiration and reflux. Um, we have now actually access to over 80, uh, to a quarter of eight, over 80 patients, and uh, we are seeing um, reflux aspiration um, or even secondhand smoking um, as a major risk factor for the development of lung disease. So I think that is um, that that um, is something that is quite important to check in this child. Um, and then um, to make sure that um, precautions, particularly with cold exposure, um, are just held. I mean, kids should wear gloves and um, should make sure that face is kept warm in winter and things like that. Or you can have them move to Florida. That helps too. So. <laughs> Well, we, we haven't talked much about cold exposure in Miami where 70 degrees is our winter. Um, yeah. A few other things in the chat I'd like to mention. So um, it brought up about the type 1 interference score, which I agree. Um, we discussed that again, the interferon would be very important. And then Scott brought up that you can send the interferon response on monocytes clinically now um, by pale that goes nationwide. Maybe Scott, if you could um, put in the chat the actual link to that test for people to know to order. Um, Amit has a question. He wants to know if there are simpler surrogates for an elevated type one interferon score done on ISGs like using Flow or ELISA. Is CD one sixty nine on monocytes good enough? Um, I, I I think it has been used as a surrogate. I don't know if it's actually been tested really well because I think interferon gamma could elevate that as well. But um, I think if you are sure that this is a type one interferonopathy, I think it is a, is it seems to be an okay surrogate mark. I've actually um, seen it it being used. Um, another uh, marker that you can use is CXCL10. Um, I don't know I think CXCL9 is mainly um on on the um, but some labs actually um, are using CXCL10 as well. So that is an okay marker as long as you know that the patient has an interferon, uh, interferonopathy because CXCL10 can also be upregulated by, um, by, by TNF. Uh, so it is not as specific, but it is a good marker if you know it's an interferonopathy. Um, it actually does correlate quite well. Um, I think Scott is referring to a four gene score that um, I just heard about, but I didn't know who offers it. Um, there is um, typically a set of six, uh, four to six genes that correlate pretty well. Um, we use twenty eight um, in in our score. Um, it it basically tells us also a little bit about negative regulator, and it has uh, some genes in there that are measured by interferon because you have to understand that uh, the interferon score can also be upregulated in the context of not mainly interferon-mediated disease. Um, some patients with H20, for example, have higher interferon scores. Um, and there are some um, toll-like -like receptor pathways that activate the interferon pathway as well. Um, um, and it can be amplified by TNF. So you have to make sure that um, you that, that you actually uh, get a true interferon signature that is driven by interferon. We use a ratio of interferon um, activated gene to interferon, uh, interferon versus NF kappa B activated genes. And if that ratio is very low, then we know it's predominantly interferon. If it is higher, then we know there's a contribution of non-interferon. Uh, components to it. So I think in somebody who has a genetic mutation, you don't have to worry as much, but people are now also using the interferon signature to screen for interferonopathies. And there it is really important to make sure that the interferon score you see elevated isn't part of a broader immune activation um, and is actually a uh, specific and mainly driven by interferon. And these ratios help to kind of narrow that down. And Manitibu also brought up um, an article published in Cell using a high cholesterol diet. What do you think of that? A high cholesterol diet to do what? To I, sorry, I don't know about a high cholesterol diet. Uh, what what is it supposed to do? Um, to suppress sting activation. There's an article that he linked to in Cell. Oh, oh, uh, <laughs> I don't think that the I. Uh, I have to. Um, I'm not aware of any dietary modification that would actually suppress 
a patient sufficient who has strong sting activation. I don't think that that would suffice. Um, um, I, I, I think this would have to be tested. I'm not sure that I, I'm, I, I'm not sure if it's, if somebody has strong savvy, you definitely need to treat. Um, if you want to use it as a modifier, I really don't know how effective it would be. I don't know. It needs to be tested. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Classic, can you want to show the next slide? Yeah, that was excellent. So really, we're just wrapping up and we were hoping to encourage discussion. So um, thank you all. So just our pending studies, like we briefly touched on earlier, we wanted to have them evaluated by POEM, including POEM imaging, like you had previously recommended, um, and then OPSO, um, as well as genetic testing for the family, like you guys also suggested, and then thyroid studies, skin biopsy, and then we have pending um, immun immunologic studies as listed. Yeah. I, I just want to add one part, and that is Jack and Hippitus work, um, but they also suppress T cells. So if patients have low, have cytopenias, and then you add the Jack inhibitor, they really need to be monitored for infections. And particularly in the lung, we've seen um, in patients with destroyed lung disease, aspergillus and fungal infections. So these patients really should, once they are cytopenic, um, and are in high doses, Jack inhibitors are monitored similar to patients with immunodeficiencies. Excellent. Um, yeah, there is very preliminary data with using uh, anifrolumab, which blocks interferon, but does not is not as immunosuppressive. Our very preliminary data look very promising, but um, I, if anybody has any questions or is planning to use it, please let us know. Uh, we're happy to actually share. I wouldn't recommend this for this patient at this point. I think uh, just repeating and finding out if he down regulates or he controls his immune response um, is, I think, the first thing to do and screen for uh, hidden signs of SAVI by looking at lung. So, yeah. so now we just wanted to open up the floor um, for discussion so we can follow along with our discussion questions or if anyone else wanted to pose a uh, question in the chat, um, feel free as well. Sure, so Jessica, we why don't we start with those questions and I'll bring up a few things in the chat. Sure, so our first one, um, what are the long-term effects of not treating our patient given he's clinically well between febrile episodes with evidence of inflammatory state on laboratory studies? Um, Manish Ron, I think you're saying an answer to this in the chat that he thinks that since this is more mild savvy, he wonders about the impact of like long jack inhibitor versus something easier like a high cholesterol diet. Um, and then Patrick also brought up, you know, any difference in the efficacy between Rinco, Rifco, which is uprasitinib, um, versus Zelgans, which is tofacitinib. Um, Rafael, do you, if you were to use a jack inhibitor, do you have a preference? Or even Rexel. Uh, well, I we have only used baricitinib because when we started um, uh, as a, a, a an open uh, an appended uh, a extended um, access or expanded access study many years ago in 2011, that's the only drug that was being made available to us. It was very difficult to get anybody else to agree to treating sick children. Um, so we only know. Um, um, we, we do know uh, the response to baricitinib, which requires a higher exposure than is needed to treat rheumatoid arthritis patient. That again is for severe SAVI patients. Um, we also know from discussions with a French group who had started with ruxolitinib that baricitinib can be dosed better and is better in interferonopathies than ruxolitinib. So they actually have suppose it, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody is there from uh, from the French group, but uh, we were told that they um, have switched patients mostly to baricitinib. Um, I think the JAK1, JAK2 inhibition and TIC2 inhibition, which are the um, mediators of, um, uh, which are the signaling molecules of the type 1 interferon receptor, are better inhibited with baricitinib than with ruxolitinib, and certainly with tofacitinib, which actually has a, a somewhat high affinity to um, JAK3. Um, again, all of them are pent JAK inhibitors. It is not that they are specific, as the label sometimes states, 
but um, they, they have higher affinity or baricitinib has higher affinity to JAK1, 2, and TIC2. Um, Opatacinib um, should work as well. I think Scott has used it in an interferonopathy patient. We have not. Um, you need to, with any JAK inhibitor, monitor um, JAK um, um, BK viral titers. And because the exposure that we that we require to treat um, interferon signaling compared to the exposures required to block uh, GM, CSF, and IL-6 signaling in rheumatoid arthritis, you are exposing the bladder to higher levels of JAK inhibitors, and that leads to reactivation of BK virus. And we have seen, now not on our side, but um, we have seen uh, BK nephropathy. So at least make sure that you monitor blood levels. Urine levels will be elevated, but as soon as you actually start having um, blood levels with locks greater than four, you are putting the patient at risk for the development of um, BK nephropathy. So um, that um, is my, uh, that I think that that is um, what needs to be monitored uh, carefully uh, with uh, JAK inhibitors. Um, and Jaden brought up a question. He wonders if there's any recommendations for slowing the development of lung disease and interferonopathies beyond hopefully suppressing the inflammation with JAK inhibitors. Yeah, the lung disease is quite complicated. Um, and I don't can't get into that uh, because it will take a, a little bit of time. The JAK inhibitors have stabilized the lung disease, but we have pro seen progression. Um, and we have seen progression in two ways. One, um, with getting um, infections or basically predisposing to infections, and particularly if there are cavitations and if there is a lot of lung destruction, you have to uh, measure galactomannan levels and make sure that the patient is not developing um, aspergillosis and fungal infections. Um, we, um, we usually... On high doses, treat patients uh, with um, uh, viral prophylaxis we with uh, valacyclovir. Um, and um, with lung disease, it is really absolutely critical that you uh, assess reflux. If there is progression of lung disease, the chances that the patient is aspirating or has reflux that is untreated is really high particularly if you see progression. We've learned this the hard way um, and you need to be very aggressively uh, monitoring patients with pH probes and get GI involved to make sure that you are not overlooking um, any GI issues. And secondhand smoking, if there's cystic lung disease in a Zavi patient, make sure that there is no secondhand smoking that the patient is exposed to. Can you speak a little bit about the MLA doses um, in these types of diseases, how you monitor it? I know commercially it's difficult to do serum amyloid levels. So serum, um, the, the um, common form of amyloidosis, and it's really, I haven't seen a single interferonopathy patient who developed SAA amyloidosis, which is uh, amyloidosis associated with chronic inflammation. Um, that... SAA correlates very highly with a C-reactive protein. If you have a normal C-reactive protein, you don't need to worry about SAA amyloidosis. Clinically, you monitor it by making sure uh, that uh, you have no proteinuria. Uh, that is basically one of uh, the first and also a severe manifestation of amyloidosis. But if the CRP is normal, you don't have to worry about um, see uh, the SAA levels to be elevated. If there is chronic elevation of, um, of C-reactive protein um, and the patient comes from a country where other cofactors play a role, there is an association of, um, of SAA amyloidosis in uncontrolled systemic inflammation um, with um, actually um, with um, uh, Per perinatal mortality suggesting that it's actually associated with um, hygiene uh, factors in uh, the country where the child is from. It's an old study in, um, in FMF, actually. So um, I think in countries where there is um, a higher chance for getting amyloidosis, you have to worry about it in the context, or you should worry in the context of high CRP levels, and then uh, monitor um, proteinuria. But 
if the C-reactive protein is normal, you don't need to worry about that. And then CP was wondering, um, so we know there's variable expressivity expressivity in SAVI. Is there variable penetrance as well in this disease? Yes. So um, the, 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 the case series are of a family history, the family history that you presented of a Finnish family is actually quite interesting because they are making the point that there might be genetic cofactors. Um, I mentioned that there are environmental cofactors that you need to, um, to uh, uh, monitor. So I think we are learning more that there likely are um, other factors that uh, help uh, explain the severity of the disease. Um, one of the issues um, that is common among interferonopathies is if there are strong genetic predispositions to tissue autoimmunity, such as um, alopecia or uh, thyroid disease, then having chronic interferon exposure early in life, even rheumatoid arthritis, leads to manifestation of an autoimmune disease, a tissue-specific autoimmune disease much earlier in life, because you are literally activating, uh, I mean, uh, so, so that is something to monitor in your patient because of the rheumatoid factor, I would make sure that the child doesn't have other genetic uh, predisposing factors such as shared epitope. Um, for thyroid disease, I don't know, actually, um, I, I'm not uh, aware of genes, but there often is a strong family history of thyroid disease, as was in this family. And almost everybody in this family actually developed thyroid disease. And those with a mutation had early onset disease and very severe um, um, alopecia, which we have seen in other interferonopathies as well. We've seen it in candle in a number of patients. So it is not specific for SAVI, any interferonopathy with chronic interferon signature um, when, when, when um, in, in the context of a genetic or a family predisposition can develop autoimmune disease earlier. So these are things that um, uh, would be um, important uh, to keep in mind um, for uh, autoinflammatory uh, diseases, uh, for interferon mediated diseases. And what do you think about high dose IVIG as a potential treatment option for savvy patients? It's not for others. Yeah, it it doesn't help. Um, it, it does actually not help the treatment of savvy. If, in some instances, may, there are a number of patients who have been treated with rituximab because they've been misdiagnosed as lupus, and they actually become chronically cytopenic and can, in rare cases, develop hypogammaglobulinemia. I think in these cases it is indicated um, as a replacement therapy, um, but I don't think there is any indication um, for uh, for treatment um, in SAVI. We have not chronically put patients on um, IVIG unless um, they have um, evidence of immune deficiencies, but as a treatment for SAVI, it's not effective. And I was wondering, so I'm an immunologist for this patient. I am global managing um, with an excellent pediatric rheumatologist. And how, from the immune perspective, how often should I monitor the immune system? The, you know, the preliminary immune workup was largely normal. Like, would so, you expect it to go down over time to change? We don't know. I think it can change. And I think that is what you need to monitor. I think initially I would uh, monitor him after every infection and um, every six months. And then I think if he remains asymptomatic, you can uh, reduce it to one year, uh, to one year, make sure that he has no lung disease. Um, so if everything is negative, um, I would just follow him like um, you would, uh, I mean, or we would in rheumatology follow somebody who has an elevated uh, ANA level to make sure that there's nothing else coming. I would make sure that you get an interferon score because that likely would become permanently positive before you actually um, would see uh, clinical features. And you mentioned a little bit the lymphopenia and sometimes hypogamba. Are those the most common clinical manifestations of the immunodeficiency that you see in these SAVI patients? Um, T-cell immunodeficiencies in the context of chronic interferon signature, yes, are seen. And um, the more typical feature in SAVI is hypogamma globulinema in the context of uh, T-cell immunodeficiency. 
Um, but over time and with chronic um, exposure, we later see um, that the immune globulin titers can drop um, as well, particularly in the context of concomitant treatment. We haven't done systematic evaluations enough to know all the factors that cause this. It's fairly rare in SAVI to be hypogamma globulinemic, uh, which is uh, more common for, uh, uh, for in, in, uh, in other um, conditions, such as uh, we see it actually a little more in candle, in some of the candle, severe candle patient than we see this in, uh, in SAVI. And Scott Canna would like to ask about sting inhibitors and what the research is so far. And sting inhibitors, yeah. how far along are you? Um, could they work in gain of function savvy mutations? So um, sting inhibitors are out. There are different several companies who are trying to develop them. So far, none is in uh, human studies. Um, the Sting inhibitors that have been developed work in vitro. Um, they actually are quite effective um, in blocking um, the downstream effects of um, of of SAVI um, of sting um, activation, including interferon production and NF kappa B signaling. Um, so uh, there, I think there is great potential, but so far um, they have had some toxicities in animal models. And I think the point is to see whether there um, is a surviving clinical candidate that eventually makes it into humans. So I think the um, in vitro uh, or the preclinical data are strong that they will work. There are also CGAS inhibitors and they basically block um, the sensor um, uh, CGAS, which is an enzyme that uh, produces uh, CGAMP, which is uh, the mediator that activates SAVI. And it is unclear if this would work in SAVI or not. There are um, several CGAS inhibitors that have uh, actually some human data, so they are likely get on the market faster. But because DING is auto auto-activated, it isn't quite clear what the benefit of CGAS inhibitors would be in SAVI. Um, they would be potentially more um, beneficial in icardi goodyear syndrome, but uh, should also be tested uh, in SAVI. So these uh, these would uh, will become available earlier and uh, are promising. Uh, so so there are promising op uh, options that are more targeted than the treatments that we currently have. And then I think the last question. Um, so Tiffany wants to know if there is a role for human non-hemopoietic cell cells with sting gain of function disease, such as in the mouse models. If there is what? Sorry, I didn't. Um... If there's a role for human non-hemopoietic cells with the sting yeah. gain of function and disease yeah. in the mouse models. We we actually strongly think we we think that I think we have um strong data that's still unpublished that actually uh, shows that there is a huge uh, impact on endothelial cells with chronic sting activation. Um, I think that whether this is the main um, um, factor in driving the, uh, the disease, which in mouse models is unresponsive to um, to, um, to bone and to hematopoietic um, transplant and um, the one patient I know of uh, that is treated by Paul Broken, who had received a bone marrow transplant, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, has not been doing well, all suggesting that the disease is not only mediated or is not mediated um, predominantly by hematopoietic cells. So I think this is a very important question and which cells, uh, whether it is mainly endothelial cells or whether there are other non-hematopoietic cells that are major driver of the organ manifestations still needs to be worked out. But it is a very good point um, to, to, to realize um, that um, there are, this is um, more complex and can likely not be treated by replacing uh, uh, hematopoietic cells. Perfect. Um, any Anything else you'd like to add or any, as we wrap up this case, any other words of wisdom or any other thoughts on this case and Savi in general? Rafael, anything else to add? Oh, I think I've, <laughs> I, I, I uh, no, 
I think this is uh, I think this was a very nice presentation of a very illustrative and very important case. And uh, I think it is important to um, really start making um, I mean, using genetic testing liberally. And I hope that um, these cases or that case illustrates the importance um, of doing that. And um, so. Thank you, Jessica. I think Jessica did a fantastic job as a pediatrics resident explaining a very difficult case with complicated underlying genetics and immunology and basic science assays. And thank you, Rafaela, for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, it was a great turnout tonight, and I think really shows the intersection between rheumatology and immunology and these autoinflammatory disorders and the crossover into the immunodeficiency. Um, reminder to everyone to register for CIS. If you did not hear the beginning, early bird registration ends on February 17th. The annual conference is May 1st through May 4th in Minneapolis. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about autoinflammatory disorders, Rafaela will be giving a lecture on this during the education day part of the CIS annual conference, which is now included um, in the regular registration. Um, Loretta asked about information about summer school. I do not know. Um, I would I would email the the info at CIS um, email address to find out about that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.